In this video we're going to go into some detail about the heart that we didn't get to in lab. And the first thing that I wanted to mention was the fibrous skeleton of the heart. And so it's important because it does a number of different things. First of all, it forms the foundation to which the heart valves attach. So you can see from the position of the uh, of the brown and the blue rings here that obviously um, these are where the bicuspid and the tricuspid actually attach. So uh, these do form a uh, formation for the heart valves, particularly the atrioventricular valves. Secondly, they serve as a point of insertion for the cardiac muscle bundle. So one of the things that you learned in AMP1 was about origins and insertions. And so the origin point is an anchor, uh, but a point of insertion is um, it's what gets pulled on. And so, as it turns out, these serve as a point of insertion for some of the myocardium. The third thing they do is they prevent overstretching of the heart valve. And so basically they're also, in addition to being a foundation for the heart valves, they serve as sort of limiters for how far that they can stretch. Finally, and this is a very important consideration, they act as an electrical insulator. And so they're made up of fibrous connective tissue. And this is not tissue that can conduct uh, action potentials. And so basically what these do is to form a physical separation of the atria from the ventricles. And because there's only a very short place, a short point, at which these action potentials can get through, they allow a delay between contraction of the atria and contraction of the ventricles. And as we discussed in lab, this delay is actually necessary for the ventricles to, to, to be filled. Okay, so we're going to talk about the structure of cardiac muscle, and then we're going to talk about the physiology of it. So the first thing to mention about cardiac muscle is that it is striated. Cardiac muscle cells are short, fat, branched, and interconnected. Most cardiac muscle cells have just one nucleus. Occasionally you'll see um, some that are binucleate or have two nuclei. And you see one of those examples actually in the diagram to the right. They are attached to the fibrous cardiac skeleton, which is just what, what we just went over. And connecting them, you have intercalated discs. And the intercalated discs are themselves made up of both desmosomes and of gap junctions. And the thing that's important about the desmosomes is their strength, uh, the strength with which they can hold the cardiac muscle cells together. If you look at the uh, smaller diagram on the top left, you can see the desmosomes actually connecting the skeletal muscle fibers. If you look at the bottom left, you'll see where there are gap junctions. What gap junctions do is they allow the passage of ions directly from cell to cell. Okay, they also have a great deal of mitochondria. This probably comes as no surprise because uh, they use the same sort of cross-bridge cycle that skeletal muscle uses, and this is going to require a good deal of ATP, so they have to have a lot of mitochondria. Okay, here's a, another picture of cardiac muscle. So, it's got a lot of components that are the same as skeletal muscle. So there's actin uh, um, arranged in thin filaments, myosin arranged in thick filaments, there are Z discs present, so you've got genuine sarcomeres here. This means with actin and myosin that you've got thick and thin fibers, so you've got A and I bands. But the banding is not quite as prominent as it is in skeletal muscle. This is something that you almost certainly picked up on in lab when you were trying to look for striations in the cardiac muscle. It's faint, it's subtle, it's difficult to detect. Finally, the T-tubules are fewer in numbers, but they're wider. And I also want you to notice here that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is not quite as extensive in cardiac muscle as is the skeletal muscle, and we'll discuss the reasons for that later on. Okay, as I said, less sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, also there's no terminal cisternae or triads, um, with there being less sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so what is it exactly that the gap junctions allow? Well, there are a couple of different things about contraction with skeletal muscle cells. There's automaticity, which is also called autorhythmicity, which means that some cells in the heart are self-excitable and they can actually initiate their own action potentials independently of any other signal.
And so basically these cells don't need any of the kind of controls um, that you talked about uh, in terms of skeletal muscle back in AMP1. So there's no um, action potentials from neurons actually needed for this. So cardiac muscle contracts completely as a unit or not at all. And this is what I wanted to get to in this particular slide with this diagram. So gap junctions are actually going to result in what are called functional syncytia. So a syncytium, as we learned in AMP1, it's been a long time so I'll go over that again. This is when you have many cells fused to form one much larger cell. Now that fusion happens in skeletal muscle. It's the reason why those cells are so large and they're always multinucleated. multinucleated. But in cardiac muscle, the cells are separate. And so how is it that they actually act together? Well, as it turns out, these gap junctions, since they allow sodium to move through um, the gap junctions, it means that sodium spreads very easily from one cell to the next cell. So when you initiate an action potential in one cell, it spreads to the next cell as if there were no cell membranes in the way. And so because they act as one, they're considered to be functional syncytia. Not literal syncytia, but functional syncytia. Okay, there are two types of cardiac cells in the myocardium, and we will go over the physiology of each of these later on in this PowerPoint. So there are contractile cells, and there are conducting cells. Each of them have some unique characteristics. Contractile cells do the actual work of contraction. Their mechanism is extremely similar to skeletal muscle. However, they've got a very different action potential than what we've seen so far in AMP. So if you'll recall, the action potential in nervous tissue and the action potential in skeletal muscle tissue is virtually identical. We're going to see a very different looking action potential in the contractile cells. The conducting cells actually don't contract at all. Now, they're still considered to be cardiac cells, but they don't contract. Instead, what they do is carry electrical signals to the entire myocardium. Um, now, these conducting cells basically serve the same function as nervous tissue. They're not nervous tissue, but they serve the same function. And they have an extremely different action potential from the, even the contractile cells. Uh, they have what's called automaticity, and we're going to examine exactly how this automaticity occurs, how, it, how and why it actually occurs. The first thing that we're going to do is take a look at neuron and skeletal muscle action potentials. And we're going to compare these to the contractile cells of the heart. And so, just as a little review, there are four stages in an action potential in both neurons and skeletal muscle. In the first one, in the resting state, you have both sodium and potassium channels involved. And so, in the resting state, the sodium channels are closed and the potassium channels are closed. Once you hit threshold from some sort of disturbance of the membrane, you go through depolarization. And as you can see in the channels at, on um, beside the number two, the sodium channels are open, the potassium channels are closed. Once you hit a value of about positive 30, then those sodium channels are going to inactivate and the potassium channels are going to open, and so you're going to get repolarization. So let me remind you that during depolarization, sodium is rushing into the cell, raising the charge on the inside of the cell because you've got a lot of positive ions coming in. Once you hit positive 30, that sodium flow completely shuts off. And the potassium flow out of the cell begins. So when these positive ions move out of the cell, then the potential on the, the charge on the inside of the cell is actually going to drop back down because you're losing positive ions therefore the charge on the inside of the membrane goes back down and that is repolarization. Now as the potassium ions leave they're going to go back down to negative 70 but they're going to go down below negative 70 and it's at this point that the membrane is said to be hyperpolarized and so during hyperpolarization two things are going to happen. 
first of all, the sodium channel is going to reset from inactivation back to its original state and the potassium channels are going to close. During this time, leak channels and the sodium potassium pump work to restore the sodium and the potassium to their original arrangement, which is lots of sodium on the outside and lots of potassium on the inside. Now let's take a look at how cardiac um, contractile cells differ from this. So the first thing you'll notice is that this is a very different looking curve. So why doesn't it just go straight up and straight down? The next thing that I want you to notice is that the time in milliseconds is a good deal longer. So we've been used to taking a look at action potentials in skeletal muscle cells and in neurons that last about two milliseconds. Now you've got an action potential that's stretching all the way up between 200 and 300 milliseconds. So here goes. Now the first major difference that you're going to see is that there are now calcium channels involved. So you've got sodium channels, you've got potassium channels, but now you've got a third actor here and it's calcium channels. Now at rest, as with the other channels, sodium channels are closed, potassium channels are closed, and calcium channels are also closed. So let's take a look at what happens in depolarization. Depolarization actually looks very much like depolarization in skeletal muscle cells and in uh, nervous tissues and in neurons. So you have a sodium channel that opens, the potassium channels are still closed, the calcium channels are still also closed. You're going to go up to a peak. This says plus 20. Um, I think that it's probably closer to positive 30 because the same type of uh, channels are actually involved. And once you hit this higher number, or this higher voltage, one thing is going to happen, and that's going to be the inactivation of these sodium channels. So the next thing that happens after this is that you, you it looks like you're going to begin a depolarization. I'm sorry, a repolarization. Um, but as the potassium is leaving, calcium is actually coming in at the same time. So there's one thing that I want to point out about calcium as compared to sodium and potassium. So the calcium ion is has a 2 plus charge and so it has a stronger charge than the sodium or the potassium. So calcium migration in is going to change uh, the charge on the inside of the membrane to a greater extent than the same number of sodium ions would. Now there's not a ton of calcium coming in, but as long as it comes in, it does manage to offset the charge of the potassium moving out. And that's the reason why you get this plateau. So the potassium channels start up a little bit faster than the calcium channels, but after an initial drop, then you see this plateau. And the, what the plateau does is to stretch out um, your action potential curve. Okay, so the last thing is going to be repolarization. So repolarization looks pretty similar to um, repolarization in the other types of action potentials that we've seen. So sodium channels remain activated. Now the calcium channels are closed and the potassium channels are open. And as these potassium ions leave the interior of the cell, that's when the charge on the interior of the cell drops back down and you get your repolarization. Okay, so again if we take a look at number one here, now this curve is drawn a little bit more sharply, uh, the uh, depolarization, it happens very fast, so depolarization is because of sodium channels opening. So um, lots of sodium channels open and you get depolarization. When these sodium channels inactivate, depolarization ends. In the second portion, the plateau phase is due to calcium, um, calcium coming in through what are called slow calcium channels. Now these aren't as slow as the potassium channels, um, but um, this does keep the cell relatively depolarized because at this point there aren't that many potassium channels open. Okay. In the third stage, repolarization happens when calcium channels inactivate and potassium channels open. Now this is what allows your potassium outflow and this brings the membrane back down to its resting voltage. So this is where you get sort of the true repolarization.
So another thing that stretches out um, this action potential is that in this tissue, the sodium channels remain inactivated a lot longer than in skeletal muscle, almost the entire time of the muscle contraction. So this, along with the plateau, really serves to extend the action potential time uh, dramatically. What this does is to prevent summation, and it prevents tetanic contractions. So uh, tetany, if you'll recall, was the sharp ascent to maximum tension by summation in skeletal muscle cells. And the example that we gave for that was basically muscle cramping, where you hit maximum tension and stay there. So uh, you don't ever hear somebody's heart cramping, and this is actually the reason why. And so what this does is to keep the heartbeat consistent in terms of contractility. Okay. So contraction is going to be triggered by action potentials, and again, the depolarization is very similar to what we've seen before. So you're going to move from um, basically from negative 90 to threshold, and then it'll peak at positive 30. Okay, so once you've generated this action potential, you have a transmission of the action potential down the T-tubules that's going to cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. And as with skeletal muscle, calcium binds to troponin, troponin changes shape, it shifts tropomyosin off of actin, and your cross-bridging of actin and myosin occurs. And the contraction is accomplished by sliding of actin across myosin. So this is exactly the same mechanism that you see in skeletal muscle. So you may recall when I was telling you when you were dissecting hearts in lab that Myo uh, that uh, the myocardium had exactly the same contractile proteins arranged in exactly the same fashion. And I said, therefore, um, heart ought to taste pretty much the same as skeletal muscle. And so that might be a good thing for you to know during your coronavirus quarantine. So if food runs low, have a heart. So the cross-bridge mechanism is the same, but the way that you get the calcium actually isn't. And so, of the calcium that you find in the sarcoplasm, 20% of it comes from extracellular space and 80% of it is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, what is it that causes the calcium channels on the outside of this cell to open? They're triggered by the opening of, sl of the sodium channels. And there's something that are called slow calcium channels. So when an action potential sweeps across this cell, what it's going to do is cause extracellular calcium to actually come into the cell. Now, in skeletal muscle, if you'll recall, the action potentials actually open voltage-gated calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's very different here. In this case, the calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum are actually opened by the binding of calcium. So they're actually calcium-gated calcium channels, as strange as that may sound. So the way that an action potential in these cells causes calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum is that the action potential opens calcium channels on the outside of the cell. Some calcium comes in, it binds to calcium-gated calcium channels on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They release their calcium and then that calcium binds to troponin. So there's a little bit of additional explanation here. This says that calcium results in the plateau phase of the action potential. So, basically, here's what happens. When the sodium channels open during the action potential, they're going to open slow calcium channels. These slow calcium channels will let calcium in slowly and cause that plateau phase of the action potential. But that's not their only job. They don't just cause the plateau phase of the action potential. Once they're inside the cell, then they're going to bind to channels that are on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, the calcium channels that are on the sarcoplasmic reticulum are fast calcium channels, so they're going to release calcium very fast. And this is really important because when you get an action potential, you want to have um, almost in almost immediate um,
load of calcium going through the entire cell. So it's going to be fast calcium channels that are on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So in repolarization, sodium channels are inactivated in the repolarization of these contractile cells. The calcium channels close and the calcium is either returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, like I said, 80% of this or 20% of extracellular space, and the potassium channels are open with potassium moving outside the cell. So once repolarization is finished, you go briefly to hyperpolarization and then you return to the resting membrane potential. All right, now, cardiac cells have a lot of mitochondria and as I mentioned earlier, this does imply a reliance on cellular respiration. So they're reliant on oxygen and I believe that I have told you either in AMP1 or in this class that although skeletal muscle cells can carry out anaerobic respiration, cardiac cells really can't. Uh, they rely almost exclusively on aerobic metabolism. So what that means is when you run into a shortage of oxygen, almost immediately, um, cardiac cells are in trouble. Whereas the same shortage of oxygen or really low oxygen levels aren't nearly as damaging to skeletal muscle cells because they've got glycolysis, anaerobic glycolysis is sort of a bridge. This doesn't happen in contractile cells. But one thing that they can do that skeletal muscle has a hard time doing is to use multiple sources to generate ATP. So not only do they use glucose, they're also going to be able to use fatty acids and they're also going to be able to use lactic acid. So let's take a look at the action potential of conducting cells. So these cells, remember, are non-contractile, and their job is to actually serve as the electrical system of the heart. And so one of the things that we've talked about already is that cardiac muscle tissue has autorhythmicity or autocontractility, and here we're going to see exactly why. So I want you to notice some things about this diagram right away. I want you to notice that the resting potential isn't a straight line that has to be disturbed by something. The resting potential is is actually always increasing. The second thing that I want you to notice is the value of the threshold and the peak of the depolarization. So the threshold is actually just above negative 40. So we're not talking about negative 55 anymore. Negative 55 has been the threshold for neurons for skeletal muscle cell and for the contractile cardiac cells. Here it's different. Also notice that the peak of depolarization is not at plus 30. It's at about 4 or 5. And so this is very different from the plus 30 that you reach in, again, skeletal muscle, neurons, uh, contractile cardiac cells. And here's the reason why. It's a completely different protein. It's not a voltage-gated sodium channel. It is a voltage-gated calcium channel. And so instead of your depolarization being dependent on potassium, I'm sorry, in, uh, sodium inflow, it's actually dependent on calcium inflow. And so you're going to have a very different um, threshold and a very different depolarization because it is a different protein using a different ion. So as you can see there is an unstable resting membrane potential and so let's go over the reason for that unstable resting membrane potential. So it continually moves towards threshold and for this reason, because it's not stable, it's called a pacemaker potential or a pre-potential. And so, how does this happen? Well, these potentials are believed to be caused by potassium coming into the cell. So, here's, um, here's another difference from any of the other cells that we've seen. And slow sodium channels. So, as with every other type of cell, there's a greater sodium concentration outside the cell than inside the cell, and so what you're going to see is sodium entering. But unlike the other cells that we've seen, these sodium channels are a lot slower than the sodium channels that cause depolarizations.
So what happens here is you get potassium entry and you get sodium entry up until you reach threshold. And once you reach threshold, calcium enters the cell through fast calcium channels. Okay, These are not the slow calcium channels that are on the membranes of the contractile cells. These are fast calcium channels. So they're going to let calcium in. You have a depolarization up to about four or five. And then those calcium channels close. The potassium channels open and you get sort of a standard um, repolarization. Okay, so here's a little bit of a closer look. And again, with depolarization, you have the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, once you hit this value of, of let's say, 3, then these calcium channels are going to close. And when those calcium channels close, your potassium channels are going to open and allow potassium out of the cell. And this does cause your depolarization, I'm sorry, your repolarization. Now once you get back to down to about negative 60, then you're going to see potassium start coming back in. You're going to see uh, sodium, uh, sodium coming in. This is going to start raising your membrane potential back up towards threshold. So this is a cell that really never is at rest. You're always going to have either an action potential going on or you're going to have a rise towards threshold. Okay, so here's your second action potential, and as with the first action potential, the calcium channels open to cause this inflow of calcium. Okay, so what this means is that there's a continuous depolarization due to these pacemaker potentials or pre-potentials. Now, I believe I might have told y'all about one of the very interesting experiences of my graduate schooling. And that was when a uh, my physiology professor actually vivisected um, one of the rabbits that had been used for antibody production. And so the rabbit was completely unsuitable for a pet, and so she put it under general anesthesia and took its heart out. And the heart sat in the dish and beat on its own. This is the reason why it was able to do that. It's because these conducting cells were still doing their job. Okay, so again your threshold here is at negative 40 not at negative 55 and again the depolarization in these cells is due to the entry of calcium not of sodium. And so again this makes this action potential really unique. Okay, you do get a slight hyperpolarization at the end of the action potentials. And again, what that does is to close the potassium channels and to reopen the slow sodium channels. And so here's something that I want you to think about. Why does every other action potential use sodium and this one doesn't? The reason why is because the sodium in this case is actually used for the pacemaker potential. And so in that case, if you've got this slow sodium entry, why turn it around and use sodium again for the depolarization? So again, with your intrinsic conduction system, you've got these pacemaker cells that constantly cause an action potential. Now, when they cause their action potential, they are going to be able to spread these to the contractile cardiac cells because when they carry out their action potential they will be able to cause enough of a disturbance to the contractile cells to cause an action potential in them. The last thing that we're going to talk about in this PowerPoint and as a matter of fact for this test material is cardiac output, stroke volume, and heart rate. And I realize that we did a lot of this in lab but it is something that I'd like to review again because it's been some time since you've seen that in lab. So cardiac output is the volume of blood that gets ejected from the left ventricle into the aorta during one minute. Two main factors go into this stroke volume and heart rate. So if you have a higher stroke volume or a higher heart rate it's going to result in a higher cardiac output. Now under most conditions at rest you only need a certain cardiac output. So if the stroke volume is high as a result of that your heart rate will actually slow. You'll get the same cardiac output uh, with a slower heart rate because of the volume of the, of the stroke volume.
And so this happens in athletes. So they have a higher stroke volume because they push out more of the blood in their ventricles during systole. Okay, so if your resting stroke volume is low, as with couch potatoes, then your heart rate, heart rate has to increase to compensate in order to achieve the same cardiac output. If you've got a lower stroke volume, your heart rate will increase. And so this is one of the reasons why heart rate is considered to be kind of a measure of cardiovascular health. Because if you've got a really high resting um, heart rate, that means that your stroke volume is pretty low, and it means that your uh, left ventricle is not as strong as it probably could be. Okay, so again, stroke volume is how much blood gets ejected into the aorta during one contraction. So we're not talking cardiac output, we're talking about a portion of the cardiac output here. Now at rest, stroke volume is 50 to 60 percent of the end diastolic volume. So I want to remind you that diastole is the time period during which the ventricles are relaxed and therefore blood flow is allowed into the ventricles. And so your final diastolic volume is going to happen right before your ventricles actually contract. And so this is your end diastolic volume. So if a stroke volume is 50 to 60 percent of EDV, this means that 40 to 50 percent of the blood actually remains in the ventricles even after a normal contraction. So it's not a dysfunction for half the blood that's in the ventricle to remain there. This is a normal type of end systolic volume. Um, so why would this be the case? Well, you've seen a lot of instances in A and P where you want to have some sort of reserve in case of emergencies. And so, if under normal circumstances, 40 to 50 percent of blood remains in the ventricles, that means that at need, you can increase your stroke volume by increasing the contractility of your heart if you have some sort of stress condition. Now, either way, whether you're under stress or not, there are three factors that affect stroke volume. Preload, contractility, and afterload, and we're going to go through all of these. Preload is the amount of stretch on the ventricle before it contracts, and so the greater amount of filling that occurs, the greater the force of contraction. And so this is a classic analogy that's used, is a rubber band. If you stretch it harder, it snaps back harder. And so the heart is actually no different here. If you stretch the ventricle out harder, it snaps back harder. This is actually something that's called the Frank Starling Law, and this law states that the stroke volume of the heart increases in response to an increase of the volume of blood in the ventricles. And so the volume of blood in the ventricles is going to be at its greatest at in diastolic volume. And so, what are the factors that affect how much blood is present in the ventricles? Well, first of all, how long does a ventricle actually stay relaxed? That's going to be the duration of the ventricle di ventricular diastole. And what is it that happens with a faster heartbeat? The duration of ventricular diastole is going to be actually shorter. So according to the Frank Starling Law, if the ventricle is relaxed for a shorter time period and there's less blood flow having the opportunity to come in, then according to the Frank Starling Law, the heart rate or the stroke volume should be smaller. Now this is the reason why when you have a sympathetic reaction and your heartbeat speeds up, there's also a signal sent to the myocardium itself telling it to contract harder. So this is compensation for this aspect of the Frank Starling Law. Okay, so how long the ventricle relaxes is one factor affecting end diastolic volume. The other factor is actually venous return. So how much blood volume is coming back into the heart. How much is coming back in from the systemic circuit? How much is coming back in from the pulmonary circuit? This is something that's going to increase with exertion because as you already know passage of blood through veins is actually, is actually accomplished by a couple of different pumps. Uh, one is the respiratory pump which is where the expansion of the thoracic cavity and 
and uh, movement of the abdomen during breathing actually pushes um, blood through veins in the abdominal, pelvic, and thoracic regions. And so this is going to be part of the systemic circuit. It's going to be all of the pulmonary circuit. Um, otherwise, venous return is accomplished by movement of the limbs. And so if you're increasing your exertion, you're going to be increasing the movement of your limbs, therefore greater venous return to the right atrium and therefore the right ventricle. If you're breathing faster, then you're going to increase, or breathing deeper, you're going to increase the effectiveness of that pump, returning more blood to your left atrium and therefore your left ventricle. Okay, so contractility is our next factor, and this is the strength of contraction. Now you can increase or decrease the strength of contractility. And so things that increase contractility are going to be what are called positive enotropic agents. And so what these do is to cause more calcium inflow during cardiac action potentials. And so um, basically here, the idea is that a greater calcium influx into these cardiac cells causes a faster calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and you're going to get stronger contraction as a result. And so what are the things that are positive enotropic agents? It's going to be the sympathetic division, epinephrine, increased interstitial calcium. And so the reason why increased interstitial calcium would cause this is because all of this, pass all of this passage of ions is basically diffusion. And if you have a higher level of interstitial calcium, you're going to increase the rate of diffusion of calcium into the cell, even through slow calcium channels. Digitalis is another positive enotropic agent. So contractility can also be decreased. So you get um, um, inhibition of the sympathetic division. So why not parasympathetic? The reason why is because there's no par parasympathetic innervation to the myocardium. And so in order to decrease contractility in terms of the sympathetic division, you have to have the sympathetic division inhibited. And so this is not a direct way of causing um, a decrease in contractility. It's sort of an indirect way of causing a decrease in contractility. Um, anoxia, which is a basically um, low oxygen levels, um, acidosis, some anesthetics, increased interstitial cal uh, potassium will also do this, and so will calcium channel blockers. Okay, afterload is your degree of resistance to the ventricle by the aortic blood pressure, and so this is diastolic blood pressure. Now this is something that we did talk about in lab at some length. Um, that the aorta has its own pressure and that the higher that it is the harder that the ventricle has to contract to overcome it okay and so if you have a higher diastolic blood pressure it means that the ventricles have to work harder in order to overcome that diastolic pressure and if you'll recall from your discussion and study of the cardiac cycle in lab there are actually two phases to to uh, systole. There is isovolumetric contraction, and there's also ventricular ejection. Now, systole is only going to last for so long, and if you have to spend a longer portion of systole in isovolumetric contraction, overcoming the aortic pressure, you're going to spend less time with ventricular ejection and that means that you're going to have a lower stroke volume as a result. And so what are factors that can cause a higher overload uh, or afterload? One is going to be hypertension, high blood pressure, and but another one is going also going to be atherosclerosis which is the narrowing of arteries. And so when remember that when arteries narrow they're going to increase resistance and it's going to take a higher pressure to push blood through those narrowed arteries.